Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on Waging War on Online Disruptors. My name is Cheryl Neve, and I'm the Education Program Manager with the OAO. Just a few housekeeping remarks before we get underway. In order to verify your full attendance at tonight's session, the time that you log in and out will be used to track your continuing education credit. Your CE certificate will be emailed to the address you provided when you registered for this session, and OAO will submit your CE credits to Arvo using the OE tracker number you provided. A speaker and course evaluation will be emailed to you at the end of the session. We would appreciate you sharing your thoughts on the quality of tonight's presentation with the speaker and our team. We have many optometrists participating on this webinar. In order for everyone to enjoy the session, you have all been muted to avoid background noise. If you would like to ask a question, please type it into the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the webinar, the speaker will answer as many questions as possible in the amount of time remaining. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Alan Glazier. Dr. Glazier is the founder and visionary behind ODs on Facebook and odsonfacebook.com, the eye care industry's largest and most highly engaged eye care organization online or off, with over 38,900 members. He is the founder of Shady Grove Eye and Vision Care, serving the Rockville, Maryland, Washington, D.C. He is a partner and business development executive in Total Eye Care Partners, enabling optometrists with mature practices a medical model legacy exit. In 2015, he was selected as one of the 50 most influential optometrists ever by his peers, and in 2017, he was honored as Maryland Optometrist of the Year. Welcome, Dr. Glazier. Thank you so much for having me again. I had a great time last night. Thanks for all the great feedback. Tonight's a really fun lecture. Before I get going, a couple things on my end. We have a huge thunderstorm here. If the power goes out, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to, to get the education to you. Um, that, that's the only thing we can't control on this end. Um, so with that said, um, I couple things. So this, this talk is called Waging War on Online Disruptors. I, when I started it, when I first gave it at a Vision Expo, it was, I called it Waging War on Warby. And there was uh, some pushback on that from certain companies, uh, a certain company that I used their 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 trade name in the talk, but it really wasn't to point at them alone. It was it was a play on words. This is about online disruption in the eye care industry, specifically around eyewear and optical. And I, I liked the uh, double entendre, the waging war and war being as a www kind of thing. So for what it's worth, I kept that in there for this talk. I'm not that worried about getting in trouble anymore. I'm on my own. Um, anyhow, uh, I have no disclosures for this talk, so no commercial in interest in anything that I'm talking about. And I do want to tell you, I forgot to tell you last night, that I am one quarter Canadian. And uh, so I'm really proud to be, I was really looking forward to getting up there. Uh, I've been there before a couple of times. But um, my, my uncle, who you see standing and walking on the right side of the screen with Queen Elizabeth, was the mayor of Edmonton in uh, 1940s. And that was Queen Elizabeth's tour across the continent then. And then on, on the left side is my great grandmother and my grandmother in 1929. In uh, I think they're in um, Moose Jaw. They they lived grew up. She grew up in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And then that's my great grandfather there, who lived to 104 years old, uh, who uh, had a uh, secondhand shop in Saskatchewan, and he also helped bootleg li Al Capone's liquor across the border and did some time in jail for that. So a little colorful history to my family. You can see that I took on his hairline as well. With that said, here we go. A lot of loud thunder here. So, um, Warby Parker, uh, are they the devil or are they an angel? And a lot of people, a lot of us hear that and we have this visceral reaction because we feel like they're taking business from us. They came up with a brand new business model that was disruptive and effective and it seemed to give the market what the market wanted and that's why they were successful one rule for business is when you're looking at something that might be competing with you if you're wondering if it's going to be successful if if the market wants it the market gets it so the market get, gets what the market wants so be be wary be wary of those companies those are the ones that are going to give you the biggest problem but you know just to make i'm going to make an argument here that they're not so bad i'm not saying that i like them particularly but but this is i want you to think about this through the perspective of your patients who who might maybe hopefully not but their customers their, their mission statement here to offer designer eyewear at a revolutionary price while leading the way for socially conscious business 
it's not a bad thing. What I do in this talk for, depending on, after we look at each of these points is I'm gonna give them a little grade. I was trying to move this slide forward here and there we go. The little angel, see that little angel down in the corner? That's a good thing for a business to do. I mean, we, we, we can, as much as we can dislike them or feel like they're competing with us, here's something good that they're doing if they actually are doing that. And then they partner with Vision Spring, a company where for every pair of glasses sold, they say a pair is distributed to someone in need. We're gonna talk a little bit about how that really works later. And I had a video about that, which was really helpful, but this technology won't accept my videos. But in any event, that's a good thing, right? I, giving glasses to people who can't afford them. The uh, CEOs there um, believe that buying glasses should be easy and fun. I, don't, I wouldn't say we don't believe that, but have we ever really sat down and made that a mission? No, so we'll give them another little angel. And they said uh, they won't necessarily make a decision that will increase profits at the expense of customers, employees, the environment, or the community. Another little angel, that's not a bad thing. So they're certified um, by the nonprofit B Lab, which um, is a newer certification for uh, standards of social and environmental performance, accountability, transparency, things like that. And, and that's how they want to distinguish themselves in this marketplace where there are a lot of online retail sales. So not a bad thing either. They'll get a little angel for that. I haven't pointed out anything bad about them yet unless it's competing with us and our opticals, which anyways, and anyone in business is entitled to compete. And your job in that situation is to come up with a different way to sell your products or a better way. They claim to be one of the only carbon neutral eyewear brands and first to market itself as a price effective force for good. That's another, uh, sorry, my allergies are killing me here. Another angel for that, two angels. Look at that. And they're innovative. They do things that, that other people don't do. They sell monocles. Do you sell monocles? I don't think you sell monocles. And it's not so much that you're ever gonna sell a monocle, but people who are browsing your optical will, will find that that will resonate with them because they've never seen anywhere that sells a monocle and they'll think about that and, and it may help them in their purchase process. They're fun. So after you try their products, they send you a video thank you with a bubbly millennial telling you how great you are for buying their your products and asking if you have any questions and following up. So that makes them not only fun, they get an angel for that, but they're responsive. And that's something that we may not do. After your patients buy their glasses, do you give them a call a week or two later to see how they're doing? I mean, that's just a call. That's traditional. That's not even internet stuff. That This is a very thoughtful way. And these videos are posted on YouTube channels and shared across the internet, so it drives more attention to them and their brand. Nobody here does that, and uh, we could. We really could, and I'll tell you in this talk later about how you can achieve that. So get a little angel for that. They make it really easy, the free shipping, free returns. They send you five frames to try, and then you pick the one you want and keep it and send the other ones back. That's a really, that's really disruptive. Nobody had ever done anything like that before. So if you think you're up against this evil empire, think again. And these are just a couple of things about teaching entrepreneur, Ship, doing good, being a core value that the CEO has sent as a message to the millennial uh, audience that he's trying to reach and others, of course, to cement the concept in their head that this is not only a, a business that's doing you good in, you know, in, in a way that you, you demanded to get you know, a different way of buying glasses, but they're doing some social good too, which again is re really resonates with the millennial generation. So devil or angel, what do you think? Just because you're a competitor doesn't make them bad, right? Well, how did we ever get to this point? There was a time when I started practice where you, you had a captive audience. So you could, people would come in for an eye exam and they would buy from your optical sight unseen. Not, no, I'm not, I wouldn't say sight unseen, but they, would, they wouldn't question it. They would walk out there in their purchase process there. And we, you know, huge margins in optical. Most of our practice profit, 50% to 60% of our profit is from optical. So, so we had this really big cash cow and, and the market chipped away at it and because they saw it too. And they came up with creative ways to do it. And it doesn't matter how they came up with it because we're at war. This was another cool video. I couldn't play it. But anyhow, we're at war because when you are in business, you can't turn over and die. 
you have to find other creative ways to everybody's always going to take a piece of your pie you know it's not your pie you're you've, you're earning that pie and if somebody comes along and takes a piece of it you have to find a way around that to get some of your pie back and that's just the way business works so if you i want the purpose of this being waging war is it's time for us to fight back it's here's some things you can do to bring that business back into your optical i asked this question in the ods on facebook and monty vickers who columnist this for a uh, review of Optometry said, just tell them the truth that optical online purchases cause leprosy. <laughs> I don't recommend you do that, but I thought it was funny, so I threw it in there. So the first thing we're going to talk about is becoming a student in history. Let's talk about the internet and the purchase cycle as it's evolved on the internet. Um, the uh, This guy is the guy that invented online shopping. I bet you didn't even know there was a guy like that, but he's the one that you used to take your uh, this was, I was really young when this happened in the 70s, but you, you, I don't remember this, but I've seen them where you put your telephone in a, in a, in a big bulky modem and, called video text and it would process information for you and it had all these crazy weird sounds that would go with it. And then in 1992, the Supreme Court had a ruling that freed web retailers from collecting sales tax uh, where there's no physical presence. And that is a, was a tremendous boost. That's where everything really started to take off. Before that, it, having an online business, there were businesses that were online, but they weren't that profitable because of the taxation issues. And the first online order ever, directly online, directly to the customer happened, it was a delivery of a pizza. As a matter of fact, this is a picture of that pizza. I don't know, I thought you'd wanna see that. I'm kinda of hungry myself. Pepperoni mushroom, um, thin crust, looks like. In 1995, this site came out, it was called Auction Web. And this was a new concept that you know now has evolved into eBay. And this is the actual first home screen of eBay in 1995. And then things evolved slowly. And in two th after 2013, online shopping, th there were a lot of barriers technologically that were lifted. More devices were being developed and the, the, um, the memories and computers got faster so they could present more graphics. Uh, there was, they normalized sharing of information online by securing it in a lot of ways. They created one-click uh, efforts so that their, the barrier to shopping was lowered. And the consumers started then, this is seven years ago, gaining trust in shopping online. There's still a little bit of lack of trust and reticence, but a lot less than there had been. And the internet you know, has changed the way we shop. I mean, we, many of us now don't even think about going to the store. We think about Amazon first or having something delivered from somewhere else home, shopping for everything uh, online. Um, so people who aren't always shopping online do other things online that, that help them shop. That, that is like pricing and product specs, availability. Uh, they may do it in your office too. We call that showrooming. And we're gonna talk a lot, a lot of strategies today on how to deal with people that showroom. You should never, ever, ever enable or let a patient showroom in your office, and I'll tell you how to do that. Um, you can not turn your office into a showroom. Um, Jody's quote from a guy, Jody Schuler, who just passed away this week. I was really sad to hear about that. But anyhow, that was Jody's quote. 2013, we'll go back there, it was, it was the era of disruption and the old tested methods of retail started to die then. And so that's a little bit about the history, understanding the terrain. The internet is somewhere you can buy anything and it's gonna continue to be somewhere you can buy anything. Don't think anything that's not nailed down in your office that you sell won't be available online at some point. The, the categories of eyewear products are increasing uh, at, a, at a pretty rapid pace. And the pressure that we feel is that if going back to the customers are having a, a, a more comfort buying online. That's, a, that's pressure for us. Um, you know, the sites are easier to navigate. Product selections are better. They're, they're offering free shipping and returns. So there's almost nothing to lose. One of the biggest reasons people don't buy eyewear online is consumer reticence to buy sight unseen. And if they can return anything, then that takes that helps them with that reticence and it lowers that bar for them to do it whereas before that was one of our big benefits being a brick and mortar business um hey amazon hastened uh greater price transparency so margins are lower online because they don't have brick and mortar uh, stores all the, you know most of them and that that hurts us and we have rents to pay of course and then shopping is very efficient online as well so Whereas in the past, people really enjoyed 
the personalized shopping experience. Like you're seeing that right now with COVID and now that people are getting back out in our area, our optical is, is doing great right now, better than usual by far, by 20%. But I think that's because people want, they want to get back out and they want to do and shop. And, and that's, that probably is a wave that will, will die down to some degree. But um, that personalized shopping experience during normal times is kind of uh, muted. Uh, and people just want it to be efficient, fast, and, and delivered home. Here's some stats on US e-commerce sales. And you can see the, the gradual increase from 2011 to 2016, uh, increasing spending 62% online. So some trends that are happening online now that will impact your opticals. Um, your, there are, the virtual reality ability of these computers is making the online experience almost store-like. You, you can push your way through a virtual store window and shop around online and almost to some degree feel like you are somewhere else. And we, by making the returns easy, those barriers to buying sight unseen, the thing that pe makes people nervous online are removed, like we talked about. Um, there are ways that there, you've seen it in frames where people are getting the look and feel without handling the actual goods. The, the frame try-on technologies where they can just plop the frame digitally on a picture of their face and see what they look like. Um, and, you know, they don't have to deal with sales clerks. That's another big thing. And we don't have to deal... Uh, if we're selling online, we don't really have to deal with reps. So, you know, there's, they're, they're cutting out certain middlemen that really might not be that desirable to some people in some situations. And there's Warby Parker clones out there. Of course, some of these companies were around before Warby Parker. They're doing different things. You have Mr. Specs and Zenny and Frames Direct and Firmu and iBuyDirect. And the point of this is, if you don't know what Alexa is, Alexa is a ranking of your website on the Internet, how, how popular it is. And the lower the number the better. So you can see that when you look at iBuyDirect and and you look at Warby Parker, Warby Parker is like doubly as popular as iBuyDirect. And for, it's even better than FramesDirect. And those are two of the, some of the most popular ones. Zenny has a little edge on them, but Zenny is, is very low end. So people go there to really just buy a spare pair for, you know, 10 bucks. So we talked. That was the terrain. Let's talk about knowing your your competitors. We'll say to be nice, uh, know thy enemy. Um, these are some policies. Some some policies of Warby Parker's, and one of them is not a policy. And so I'm going to let you read. I'll read through them real quick. Number one, you have to return the samples or you're charged for them. Number two, trade in old frames for new ones. Number three, you can provide. You must provide a written signed Doctor's RX. And number four, all frames are available in multiple sizes. So one policy here that helps us that is not a policy of Warby's is that number four is not, they don't have all frames in multiple sizes. So people get these frames and they put them on and they, they think they look good, but they're not the right size. There's a gap between the bridge. They're too wide for their face. They, they're looking through the top of the frame. I have some pictures of some really pathetic looking uh, online purchase fits later in the, in the talk. But this is the first point that you can use when you discuss with your patients why they shouldn't go online to buy their eyewear. Things you may not know about Warby, they have their own app for measuring PDs. If you don't return the samples within one week, you, you have to put a $500 deposit down to get those five samples. If you don't return them, you don't get that deposit back. And some people have said that they make a ton of profit off of that. And those are bad profits. People that that happens to are not happy and they're not going back to Warby. You know, they lost a lot of money doing that. And I understand that policy, and uh, but but I, I can also understand how that, it, that that mirrors the things we shouldn't do in our practice with bad profits. You shouldn't have uh, a late fee charge for patients or or a no show charge. It just doesn't work because it always builds ill will, and you're not going to get rich on a twenty-five dollar no show fee. So they have their own content engine, which you can have too, uh, where they build. And I showed you that earlier. They build their video content. They answer questions and have these. Uh, Bubbly millennials reach out to people so that they feel all warm and fuzzy about their purchase. They have an insurance program that allows them, you to trade in old frames, even, even they say even lost frames. So anybody can do that every time they purchase one or damaged. They give you $60 for $60 a year and half the cost of each frame. So that's, that's you know, they're, they're, these frames are made in China. They're, they're made at a very low price point, and um, that's still very profitable for them. They don't offer these things. So if your patients are in these prescriptive categories, you can probably keep that sale. You just have to explain to them how, what goes into making a pair of glasses with more than 375 sill or you know 167 index, uh, 
sorry, below minus, oh, 820, above, I should have above in there. Glass is above minus eight. They also aren't willing to do these things. Uh, the the uh, uh, below, my, what's this, above minus 10, or below minus plus six, I should say. Uh, they add powers only range plus 75 to plus 375. Uh, they ask people to call if their RX is over eight, and they try and they try and uh, upsell them. Uh, the suns only go up to minus seven, uh, combined with sphere sill power. And then if they can't fill it, they still want you to buy a frame from them. So they offer 10% off to get the frames, and then those are the people that come in with Warber Park, Warber Parky. Yeah, there's something new with Warby Parker frames to uh, take elsewhere. And for 167, they're thirty dollars extra. Apparently, they do do 167, unlike my last slide. So they just charge more. So it's an upsell. So now you know your enemy. Let's talk about changing the hearts and the minds of your patients who want to go buy from Warby. And we're gonna we're gonna focus a lot on this on millennials. Of course, a lot of this applies to older uh, consumers as well, and even younger ones now. But you know, millennials are a huge swath of discretionary purchasing power in in the U.S. and in Canada as well. And they influence the older generations. So what their trends are gradually gradually drip into the older generations, fashion-wise and behaviorally to some degree. And they value simplicity in technology more than anything. And they value comfort over a fashion over comfort, which those two things kind of uh, butt heads if you think about them. But anyhow, um, so they want to have they're very image conscious and they're looking for a look. And, and Warby and some of these online opticals cater to that look. So you have to make sure in your optical that you cater to that as well. So they, they like, millennials prefer brand experiences and things that em empower them and enable them to share online. That's why those videos were so great. They're, they become viral, they get sent around from one, uh, one 30 year old who buys Warby Parker glasses to his group or her group of friends. And that internet sharing is kind of how these youngsters grew up doing this and, and on, and they're comfortable with, with doing that. So the more content, we talked about content last night, the more content, video content you can produce and share and get out there with your patients, the more th you'll be appealing to that group. Uh, the try before you buy model is very popular in them, with them because it was disruptive and it was convenient and it helped them uh, fashion from home and 45 percent of millennials are more likely to buy from a company that supports a charity so they have their vision spring charity where for they say for each pair they donate a pair to charity and we'll get into what they actually do later but these are all things that really draw the millennials in to to this or to these brands and these products so the first thing in changing hearts and minds is disrupting their communications. And you do that with your website and your mobile strategy, both on, online and in your office. It's very, very important to have a modern website that's also optimized for mobile, meaning that when, when you look at your website, that the, its image renders like you want it to render on other platform, on mobile platforms like Apple and Android and Google and these are these are this is very important because it's it just it, it works everybody's using different platforms and you want to you want to have a good look and feel like a modern look and feel I can't tell you how many times I look at websites on my phone that are not not rendering well but they render fine on the desktop and most people are not using desktops to to view the products and services they're looking for they're using their mobile devices so what do I mean by a modern website? Well, it has to be sexy and pretty and well designed. It has to be easily navigable. Navigable, and there's a whole a whole list of things that that I have that that a website should be. This talk isn't on websites, but um, I'll, I'll talk about some of them here today. Uh, it's also important to have a customized website, not a cookie cutter website. You don't want something from a company in the eye care industry that that sells websites and they have the same site for every everyone yeah I've seen that before you can look at VSP sites if if you're using a VSP site that they offer for free it's a cookie cutter site everyone has the same thing yours should mirror the look and feel of your business 
it, it needs to do that also because when these people come into your business, they have a preconceived notion on what your business looks like and feels like from what they've seen online. Can you imagine if you have one of these practices that hasn't been redecorated since the early 80s and it's got paneled walls and, um, and shag carpeting and you have a super modern website and people choose you from the website, oh, that looks like a practice I think I wanna to go to. And they come in and they see something and it, it's a total disconnect for them. They're, they don't even, they're not even sure they're in the same place because in their head, the, they have this perception of what it was gonna be like based on your website. And, and right there and then, you're going to lose the most important thing in the purchase process, and that's the customer's trust. It's subconscious, they're not really not trusting you, but subconsciously, they feel like they just got the wool pulled over their eyes, the shag carpet pulled over their eyes, we'll say. It's, it's, it's incongruous, and you don't want that. You want your website to have the same look and feel of the design of your office. It's very important to do that. And then to have an up-to-date internet marketing effort. You want to have a great active Facebook page. You want to be high in search engine optimization like we talked about last night, and, and I told you kind of how to do that as well. So, so put the time and effort into marketing because that's a big part of the sales cycle in your practice and it does have an impact on your success. So the, the website, what, what I was trying to get across before is that the website is a virtual extension of your brick and mortar location. That's what I meant by this congruity that you need to set up. It needs to look like that. And when, it, when we say that your website, sorry, <coughs> when we say your website what needs to be social, it has to have all the, the the um the buttons and and all the uh things that people could click on to share elsewhere because that's what you need you want them to share your content on their social pages so that people see them and they learn about you because people trust the recommendation of friends over other people so, immediately subsequent to this talk i'm doing a talk in odies on facebook uh called yelp help where we talk about uh, everything you need to know about social review. So I hope you'll join me there if you have the time after this. It'll be live in the Facebook feed and in a, in a Facebook Live. Um, but social sharing is huge with this generation and, and it's getting huge with even up to my generation. I'm 54 now. So what does your store look like? What, what does it look like to the shoppers? The online shoppers are not looking at your store the same way you look at it. They're looking at it as a showroom. They're there to find what they need and do research and then go back and find it less expensive, more convenient online and purchase it. 45% of the people who showroom though want to buy it online. So a majority of the people who do showroom really don't want to buy it online, but they're just educating themselves in the shopping process. Make it natural. We're going to talk about strategies now to make it natural for people to order from you, not from the competitors. Um, it's easy to shop online, so why are they coming to you? They come to you for your the experience. Like I said, all these people cooped up here for three months from COVID want an experience now. They're tired of being in their house. They want to come out. They want to interact. They don't want it to be rushed, and it's not now because we're not seeing a full book of patients, but they're spending more because they miss the experience. So, so that part of the, the customer experience is still there. Uh, it may never, it may never go away, but it may also. But for now, we, we need to provide that because that's what we offer. We also offer our expertise as eye doctors and opticians and people who know what it takes to make a quality pair of glasses. Well, we will talk about that as well. So, retail websites nowadays have things like this, and I'm presenting this list so that you can consider maybe getting these things on your website and going a little bit omni-channel, I'm not saying necessarily to have an online optical, but at least having options for people to look at online are good so that they can come in and you can have your opticians give them a chance to sell by getting in front of the patients. You know, they, your opticians can't sell if, if you're handing out or your receptionists are handing out written prescriptions. In our office, we require the opticians hand out the script. If a patient says, Dr. Glazier, can I have a copy of my prescription? I'm like, sure, and I'll walk them out to the optician. Because if the patient never gets in front of the optician, there's zero chance of making a sale. And, and that's a really important thing. So on your retail website, these things kind of take the place of some of, uh, of the things that they're looking for when they go elsewhere online to buy products. Things like 
e-wallets or ability, different methods of paying like Google Pay and Apple Pay from your website. Social logins, so buttons for Facebook and buttons for Twitter that take them to your social properties. Uh, online reviews, have a link through to your online reviews. You, you can even have uh, a screenshot of some good online reviews right on your site. So you kind of, you know, you're kind of, uh, you know, filling the deck with good reviews in front of their face. And they may not click through and see some of the less than perfect reviews you have. Have product videos on there. Uh, information on the specifications of the products that you have, the colors, the sizes, the shapes, the brands. Have personalized recommendations, uh, pictures of your staff with their favorite products and say, Missy, our optician, really loves this brand because da 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 da. These are all things that people that resonate with people and make the whole experience of visiting your website more personable and make them more likely to buy from you. Um, wish lists, you can use that in any way you want. And then have some home delivery options, perhaps. If you're in a community and people are busy professionals and they can't come pick them up, maybe you can drop them off or maybe ship it to them. We do that. So you want to be able to create uh, engaging content and share it. I'm just going to turn some air on. It's getting a little hot here. Um, and because, you know, the millennials, like I said, are sharing the those videos and the things about the companies that they like and the products they use using their mobile devices, um, consumers, you know, they, they, want, they want information and they want entertainment at the same time. That's the world we're in right now. <clears throat> and uh, if it's a mobile email um, that you're going to reach out to people with emails and things, they need to be short. Um, you, you don't, you want a lot of good information on there. You just don't want it too crowded with information. And a few, only a few button clicks to, to get through a purchase cycle or one the less the less the better the more likely they are to purchase from that um so you, you have to give them a reason to want to share as well and you can you can do that by either having great content entertaining content you know, content that has a lot of good resource and information in it or maybe through a contest or a charity uh and and that's a way that the thing that people using on their phone are more likely to hit the share button with their friends remember last night we talked about how other types of content or contests and charitable efforts and things like that that are that resonate very well with the younger generation online. Now, this is really important for us because everyone here can do this and, and you got to do this and you got to start doing it soon. It's pretty easy. Everybody here has one of these. Everybody has an independent practice at least and um, you know, these are customer communication software tools. There's a couple on here I've left out. Again, no commercial interest in any of them. They, Warby and other companies like Warby use mobile email and online advertising to get in front of your patients with their products multiple times a year. Heck, multiple times a month. I know I'm on Facebook all the time. I see advertisements for eyewear from, from a whole ton of companies and online eyewear as well as some of the major frame manufacturers and when they if my patients hear from me once a year with a recall and that's it in between if they need eyewear or they see something they like I'm going to lose that purchase because other people are getting in front of my patients more than me so you can use these tools to send out newsletters and promotions and and um and and news about products and videos and things like that multiple times uh you know, every quarter or, or, or more frequently than that, so that you're staying in front of your patient in between the time that they come in from one exam and get the recall for the next, because you're out of sight, out of mind otherwise. And if you think about that, that's a really big problem. You're hemorrhaging, you know, 10 to 20 percent of your profits in optical because of that. And you can get those back, or a significant percentage of those. Just get in front of your patients. Don't think about them as only people you see once a year and they buy from you once a year. You know, the more times you can get people into your optical, the more you'll sell. It doesn't have to be their eye exam. People want sunglasses during the year. They want different fashions. You've heard the practice management experts say that that people have 10 pairs of shoes, but one pair of eyeglasses. Well, your, your opticians need to do a better job at getting that message out to the patients when something new comes in and multiple times a year and exposing them to that. Now it's getting cold in here. <laughs> Effective little air conditioner. <laughs> so 
the the uh, just on this slide, we already talked about the first two bullet points, but but those those millennials that share the videos share with 80 people on average. And if those people are within a region that could come in and see you, it would be reasonable to expect over time with them seeing them share products that 10% or maybe slightly less, eight, eight customers might, I'm just making that number up, I don't have any kind of data on that, but might come in. That's And if you have 20 people doing that, and you're gonna have 160 people coming in. So you see how, how this blossoms and how you need to be out there with the content. You can do this. Indoctrinating the troops. This is some hardcore uh, art of war stuff that we're gonna get into. So it's some of the things that you, you know, the thing you really wanna do, as we talked about earlier, is, is emphasize the customer experience. This is something you can give the patient that none of those online opticals can. And most of the patients that see you have a degree of trust for you and they like your business and they come back year after year. So you have one up there as well. They don't know these online companies from Adam. So if you have one of your staff, a salesperson preferably, or somebody who is very smart and talented in, in the front desk area who, who understands the customer experience, you should coin, give them a title as customer experience officer and and w explain all of this to them. Here's what we need, we need you to do. We need to make sure that the experience from the time that patient walks into the time they leave up in the front of the office, because the doctor is going to be responsible in the back of the office, doctors and the techs, is, is a really high level experience. You know, you want it to be anticipatory. If they came in last year and they, you offered them a coffee and they said, how do you take it? And they said, cream. The next year when they come in, you should have a note somewhere about that and have a coffee with cream ready. That really impresses them. You, in, in that case, you're not only meeting what their expectations of their experience are in your office, you're exceeding them. And there's a lot of little, little things you can do like that that will make patients take note of the superior experience you're providing. And that's exceeding expectations. Everything you do, you should be attempting to exceed customer expectations. That is a wow experience. People don't share things online that aren't wow, that don't wow them. If it's just eh, they scroll right past it. It has to be something really cool. So make sure that your customer experience officer is out there encouraging patients to use their phones to take pictures of the things that are happening around. And if they're questioning a frame, take a picture of it, send it to a friend and ask them what they think. And these are the kind of things that get that sharing going making it easy, making it fun, and having uh, the right person in the office in charge of it. Now, we talked briefly about this thing called information asymmetry. And what, what that means when it comes to the online purchase cycle is that consumers can't test the products that they're buying ahead of time. And that creates reticence. Uh, it's, it's something that, that in the back of their mind is holding them back to a degree from the purchase cycle of buying online. And that's something you can use to your advantage because you're right, you're gonna be hopefully right there in front of them with the products that they can touch and feel and see and put on. And that's a message you wanna get across subtly. Educating your, you do that by educating your patients through the whole process in your office on the products, the medical and the optical aspects of eyewear. And make it, and, and not make it sound, it, it is, just get, the, get it through their heads that, that while Warby has seemingly simplified everything, what they haven't told you is that there's more to just an optical center in fitting a pair of glasses. And walk them through the process. Tell them how it could potentially create problems for them having the script, the, having the um, this centration off a millimeter, the, the impact of prismatic effect. Uh, either if the, also if the glasses are, don't fit, fit either too low or too high. Um, make show the buyer you know what you're talking about, and that that of course they want you to go buy online, but they're, they're clearly not up to snuff because they didn't tell you that there's no, they're, they asked you, they want you to give us your PD. Well, did they say whether they wanted a near PD or a distance PD? Patient will go, I don't know. I'm like, well, I can't make it with, I mean, if they're reading glasses, I, you know, they should have told you to get your near PD. If they're distance, they should have told you to get your far PD. They didn't tell you that? I don't know if I would trust that. You know, those kind of things are the kind of, way you want to talk to the patient. So you're, you're not lying to them. You're, you're telling them the reality of something that they may discover after making a purchase and, and end up regretting it. They will thank you for that. And you will look like the true professional that you are when you do that. 
and they talk about their state-of-the-art tech, and you can argue that by saying that they have a low-quality acetate. If you take, I had a video of this too, again, we couldn't play videos today, but if you take a Warby Parker frame and you twist it, you know, right right with the bridge a little bit, you'll hear it make a ee -ah, ee -ah, ee -ah. I call it the Warby Parker song. I show that to my patients when they come in with the glasses that they want me to check, because I, I try and tell them this is really, I show them the spring hinges under a microscope because they're, they're you can see the plastic has been filed. And then I'll show them from a high quality frame how, how, they, how the hinge is. You know, they don't have, I don't think they have any frames yet, if at all, or they will with spring hinges. So a lot of patients like their spring hinges. They're really disappointed when they get a, a frame from an online optical that doesn't have a spring hinge. They don't have free form in their multifocals and um, not in this, so they don't use individualized lens technologies as well. These are all really good points for you to bring up with the patient so they know what they're getting. Um, Bain and company did a study on all this back in 2012, and they, they, this was their conclusion that we, we need to emphasize and differentiate our quality of care and personal service uh, that online competitors can't match and likely will never be able to match. Bain and company is the real deal. They're real consultants. So educating and indoctrinating troops. Now we're gonna talk about some defensive tactics here. Showrooming tactics, and what is showrooming again? Well, showrooming is when people come into your optical, either with or without the intent to buy, to get information from your products and research the purchase cycle elsewhere. Uh, and we've all seen people do that. It's very, uh, it can be very upsetting because it, 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 you feel like you're being taken advantage of. So one of the things you can do and you should do is in your office, you know, they're going to flick over. If they flick over to your uh, Wi-Fi, you can block their firewall. You can have the firewall block certain sites and the most common ones that people use to shop online. So they, they may be able to look at your frames and the prices and the details on the temples, but they're not going to be able to then immediately right there go over and look at Warby or Zenny or Firmu. You can't, you can't, they can't expect that not to happen, and, and you're not doing anything wrong doing that. You actually, if you're not doing that, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. You, those companies shouldn't be able to have, to show their products in your space, and you can do that by using your firewall. Talk to your tech people. Become king of their Wi-Fi landing page. So it, you, you can own people's Wi-Fi landing page. When they walk in, if you connect to their Wi-Fi, you can rule it and push tax rewards and incentives and discounts at them. You know, every, people, I think it's something like 95% of people that get a text, look at it immediately. So what if the minute people came through and you hijacked their, you know, with their Wi-Fi and their landing, you sent them something or an SMS message or something, and it said, welcome to your opt, welcome to my optical. Just for walking in, you get 10% off your purchase. And of course, it's a discount there. They're gonna go, oh, well, uh, you know, Maybe I won't go online. I already got 10% off here. Let's see what we can do here. So um, locate that lo these location-based rewards are what they call it, and people who showroom respond to that. They're three times as likely, some studies have shown. 98% of SMS messages are open immediately or within a very short period of time. So, um, you know, and if you have their mobile phone number and you get permission for them, you can push them stuff afterwards too. I was telling you how they get exposure throughout the year. If you send 10% off a new pair of sunglasses, Two months after they were in your office, hey, if they've used up their, their vision benefits or they're just in the shopping mode, they may come in and take advantage of that. But if you don't do it, it may be the opposite. You may not, not get a sale. You may actually lose a sale. So other showrooming tactics, uh, tactics use private branding of frames that they can't showroom online, have good quality stuff. There's a lot of companies out there that make high quality things that you can have in your office and people can't find them elsewhere. Uh, have better pricing if you're able to, you know, like we talked about, educating the customers about this. Uh, have great merchandising. Uh, this company that uh, Bill Gerber runs called OMG Marketing, look them up, they're fantastic. They, they help put little video screens in the, in the room, they help really pretty it up so it looks like a place that people do wanna shop with that technology to boot that, that really draws in young people. Keep your frames locked. That's a really big thing. That way they can't go in and get them, although that, that does create a problem in the purchasing process. It creates a, a, an artificial barrier between the person and the product, and some people that's a turnoff in the buying cycle. So you may or may not want to do that. 
um, and play on that reticence they have to buy sight unseen. They're not even conscious of that, but you are. And you can talk about what their experience may be like. We're going to show some examples in a little bit. So, you know, buying sight unseen makes people nervous. Uh, they're worried not only about how the frame will fit, but that the company may not be able to decipher or make the RX uh, properly. Uh, something can go wrong between the Dr. X and the manufacturing time, and nobody can fix them if they don't fit properly or they'll have to return them. These are all things that are that they're thinking about when they're weighing the pros and cons of shopping with you and shopping online. Here's, uh, I took this off of a Yelp page. Uh, they, the, the highlighted part says, but understand for $95 all inclusive, you're going to be sacrificing something. In Warby Parker's case, it's quality control. So these people um, are telling other people, understand, you know, eyeglasses, high quality eyeglasses cost more. So what are you giving up? And again, a lot of people, they haven't verbalized this, but they're thinking this. And if you know everything they might be thinking, and you can address it to them, then you're going to improve your chances of making that sale. You can talk about the risks of having a pair of eyeglasses that 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 aren't optically correct. This person says, needless to say, I had splitting headaches for a week, a few weeks. I'm really picky when it comes to my eyesight, though. Well, let me tell you, you have some high bar there, Casey. Um, it's your eyesight, after all. You know, we care about it. We really want to make sure you see well. And if those glasses are off just a tiny bit, you can end up with splitting headaches. And this is the kind of verbiage you want to use when you're up in your in your exam room or you have your optician salespeople using. And there's other things other than headaches, like eye strain. This person says the axis for my astigmatism was 10 points off. And explain to your patients what that means, being a couple points off in SIL and how that you know, they might see clearly during the day, but they'll have glare and ghosting and halos and aberrations at night. Anything from that to really getting eye strain and headaches and not seeing clearly and maybe being at risk of having nighttime driving issues. Talking about these things with your patients brings to the surface these subconscious fears they have about reticence of buying things, <clears throat> sight unseen and the reticence about somebody inter interacting with the doctor's prescription and, and what are the odds that they're going to get that right every time, right? Then there's the PD topic. Um, you know, we we can ha take that opportunity of providing a PD instead of holding it back and looking like we're we're being defensive, using that time to have the optician talk and sell during that time. So, you know, what we do is we provide PD under one condition, and that's that we ask they bring wherever they get their glasses in for a check. And we, when they do that, we undoubtedly find something wrong, either the lack of spring hinge or the file down edge that we talked about. I think I have a picture of that coming up. The optical center is always off to some degree. The mounting or the fit, or I'm not telling you to do this, but this is just something you can do with it what you want, that Warby Parker and those companies don't explain to people that near PD is different from distance PD. You want to give them the right PD because you're ethical, moral people. But they don't know that, and, and you, you want to use that point to prove to them that what kind of an operation are you buying from if they didn't ask you this question? This is the most basic question, the first thing that any optician worth any salt would do. And, and you don't know, but we're going to help you. What are you going to use your glasses for? Are you going to use them for driving or for reading or both? And then that's where you take, you get that trust. And that's where you start to convert that patient into buying from you. There's the made in China mark on the frames you can point out. There's the, uh, there's that, Look at that beautiful work on that hinge. Ugh, it's it's crooked, it's tilted. You can see where they filed the plastic and they haven't polished it. It's a terrible, terrible joint right there. And you want to show that to them as well. And then I, the music to my ears is the uh, the Warby Parker song, like ee -ah, ee -ah, the frames. And it's really funny when you do that. You say, and then you show them one of your good frames that don't doesn't make that, and you explain what the difference is between a good quality and a poor quality acetate. The perception of not giving a PD is is really is a, again in that negative profit center. It doesn't reflect well on you. People don't understand what a PD is, and you can't ex assume that that they don't that they they think it's something easy and simple because those companies tell them it is, and doctors should provide it. Of course, we shouldn't, but if we do or we don't, we're we're doing we're we're doing it for whatever 
however it reflects on us. This person said, the fact that PD is not automatically included as part of one's eyeglass prescription makes me violent. Now, you know, most people won't get violent about it, but they do have a visceral feeling when you say that because they feel that you're defensive and you're holding something back that they have a right to have. And that doesn't reflect well on you. It's not going to help you make a future sale and you might even lose a patient. Some things that you can say and to have this, what can I do to protect the public mentality? We are licensed professionals charged with keeping the public free from harm. Now, that company didn't even tell you whether you should have a near or far PD. And they, 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 in my last patient, they, the astigmatism was off 10 degrees. So um, fitting and installing the lenses requires more than just a PD. We have to have the frames angled right. That's called pantoscopic or retroscopic tilt. We have to have you looking through the center of the frame and not through too high because there's prism, there's fitting heights and adjustments. And they don't take any of that information because you're taking a chance that they're going to fit okay with just that one data point they want, the PD, and that's not going to happen. So um, waging an effective propaganda campaign. Here's some of the things that you can do. Emphasize the quality. This person said, try it on a pair at a pop-up shop and they were flimsy, but cheap. <laughs> flimsy, but cheap, as opposed to flimsy and expensive. I think that would be even worse. Emphasize the lack of spring hinges. This person says the hinges don't have double springs, so they look pretty fragile. And double springs, what they're referring to are, you know, spring hinges. Most people who have bought from private independent opticals are used to that, and they understand the value. This person says glasses are not comfortable. I think I would have been better off going to a more hands-on, i.e. expensive optician to find a pair that fit really well. And we don't have to be more expensive. You can tell the patients, look, we, and this is a real, I recommend doing this, say, we're not more expensive. It's just that the things that are up on the shelves are the things that most of our patients want. You're using a concept called social proof when you do that. Most people want this. That means that that person subconsciously is going to want what most people want. If you want the things that are priced at a, at a price point like you can get online, we have those in the drawers over here and you can look through them. Of course, they're not going to want that, but they don't know that you have different options. You have to tell them about that. Um, have comparison pairs and do demonstrations. This person said, cool glasses, but honestly looked like they're cheaply made frames from China. People know, they really know. This person, in terms of fitting limitations, gla my glasses are the only item of apparel that are with me every waking moment, so I think it's worth more to spend more to get the perfect pair. They don't accept vision insurance, so if people have vision insurance and they're in your office, there's no reason they need to go to Warrior Park. You have to say, look, just, just let's get this done right now so you don't have to deal with all that. And, and with your um, with your copay and your um, your out of pocket, you know, you're you're gonna spend about what you would spend at Warrior Park and get something much nicer. And have a photo montage about the great fits people get from online optical. This first one isn't real, but I thought it was a great place to start. Look at how that fits. How much prismatic effect is she getting if that's a minus four or above, huh? Fit by an expert. That AR. Just sorry for using it's crap, you know, look at that. And look at the gap between in the bridge. She's gonna have some real serious red marks on that bridge. The Asian fit, not gonna work real well online. And even I have a really flat bridge and, and it, I couldn't buy online like that. This is a terrible look for this, this person's face shape and for the, the coloring, I mean, it's terrible. So um, I'm gonna skip by this because I wanna get to the questions. They don't sell bifocals, not a lot of people know that. They don't put prism in eyewear. So lack of options, we said, for people with, with uh, flatter bridges. Um, and wide faces also are very hard to get fit at Warby Parker. And remember them about returning the samples. The charitable giveaway, they, they don't really give away a pair for every pair they sell. You know, they're spending pennies on these pair using Chinese factories to make them. So what they do for each pair they sell for $150 in the U.S. is they take the cost of that frame and donate that cost to charity. So they're not really donating a frame unless they were going to make it, and they're not making it. They're not making eyewear and sending it to poor people. They're, they're donating pennies, pennies on the dollar, maybe even less than pennies for each pair. So they're not giving a free pair of glasses for every pair. They're giving their cost of a free of a pair of glasses. So, oh, I'm going backwards here, sorry about that. They claim to be carbon neutral, but is there really a, a Chinese carbon neutral frame manufacturer? I doubt that. I, there's no regulations over there like we have. They've, they've been known to uh, 
screw their employees over. And being this young, cool, millennial charitable company, I was shocked to see this article. This was a long time ago, though. And other strategies, I talked about selling other things for $100 or less, but you just don't have those out on the board. We talked about the free form lenses, and we talked about the, the noise they make when you twist them. In my experience, I bought a pair. Um, I had to lay out $625, and um, they were really responsive. Here's the um, email they sent me, and you know, I ended up sending it back. I didn't like what I got. Uh, but but you can see there's a lot of ways to strategize here. And uh, now I'll be able to take questions for about four minutes until I have to go over to the Yelp Help lecture on ODs on Facebook. So thank you so much. And you can always, oops, I don't think I have my email slide in here, but it's aglazier, A-G-L-A-Z-I-E-R, the at sign and the word your eyesight, Y-O-U-R-E-Y-E-S-I-T-E.com. And you can email me questions or contact me any other way. Thank you, Dr. Glazier. Thank you. So I, before we get to question, I just want to notify everyone that due to an unexpected illness, tomorrow's webinar on concussions has been postponed and it will take place on Wednesday, June 24th. So the next continuing education webinar in this June series will be on Tuesday, June 16th. And an email to that effect was sent out to you about four o'clock this afternoon. So do check your email about that. Cancel. So tomorrow's webinar is canceled or postponed. So Dr. Glazier, um, we have a question here. Do you see a difference if the doctor enters the frame room to recommend frames and types of lenses? The doctor, I guess, as opposed to if one of your friends. Frame room. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think you may be asking about the handoff, and I would say yes. It's really important that the doctor hand off the patient. We we do it. We have the optician come into the exam room and we have them sit down and we have a conversation. I think that's a little more impactful and it also doesn't expose the doctor to the waiting area where they may get tied up talking to people. So so I would say I like to do the handoff in the exam room and talk about the whole situation right there. Great. Thank you so much. My and pleasure. I know you gave a lot of tips about reducing or discouraging showrooming, but somebody was wondering if you had even more tips on that topic. No, that, that was pretty comprehensive there. Um, I, I don't have any other tips I can think of right offhand. I'd be better, I, I'd probably do better handling of questions, mm -hmm. you know, on that. So sorry not to be able to, to help you with that. Well, I think that question came in just as you were getting into that topic, so you've probably answered this person's questions oh, in your okay. presentation. Yeah, so. like, well, I talked a lot about that. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so that's all the questions we have at this time. So I want to thank you, Dr. Glazier, for your really insightful presentation. Thank um, the you, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. So this webinar will be uh, has been recorded and it'll be posted on the OAO website within the next few weeks. Please complete our survey as you log off. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good night, everyone. Good night.